Hello, and welcome back to The Man's Kitchen. It is me, your host, James the Man's Man. And today, we are going to be doing a review video, not a cooking video. And I'll show you our uh, review slash buying guide right after this. Okay, we're back from the intro. If you like today's video, I hope that you hit the like button. And if you like my channel, hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, that way you can get updates of upcoming content. Alright, today we are going to be talking about pots and pans. We're going to go over a couple different types. And we're going to talk about features you should look for in all these types. And 90% of the stuff on my table here is KitchenAid, but that doesn't mean you have to run out and buy KitchenAid products either. Now first, if I were going to go out and buy the bare minimum for my household, I would probably get one pot, uh, maybe a little bigger than this. I would probably get one pot and a cast iron frying pan. With the two of these, you can do, you can pretty much do everything with the two of these. Might be a little difficult, might be a little challenging, but these are the two I would go out and get unless if I had no money whatsoever and that's all I could afford, that's what I'd get. Now I would start with a cast iron because these things last forever. Um, they are non-stick as long as they're properly seasoned and I find them to be easier to take care of than an actual non-stick frying pan. You can cook, you can do everything from omelets in here to steak dinners and desserts. You can do, there's very versatile, there's a ton of stuff you can do in here. There's a few things you shouldn't really do in here. Um, I would avoid doing anything in here that contains a lot of high acid because uh, it'll eat into it. It won't really damage the pot, but it's going to give you a negative flavor in your meal. Um, also, I know sometimes you see people, uh, videos where they cook everything in here and vegetables are one thing I would try to avoid doing a lot of in here. Um, cast iron really gives a bad flavor to vegetables. Um, at least so they say. That's what the, the textbook, the textbook actually says that. The textbook I had to read for college actually says not to use cast iron frying pans for vegetables because the metal leaves a bitter taste on your vegetables. That is exactly what it says. Now I've used, done many vegetables in here. If I'll cook a, a steak, I'll pull the steak out. I've rendered that fat down. There's some steak grease in here. Throw my mushrooms, my asparagus in here. I'll pop it out. I think what they're really talking about is things like stir fries. Like you don't want to throw onions, mushrooms, peppers, bean sprouts, all that kind of stuff in here. Then add a sauce and mix it up because if that sauce has any acidity to it, it's really going to affect the flavor. But with that said, this thing can do a ton of stuff. You can do your eggs in it, your bacon, you got breakfast done. You can cook pork chops, steaks, fish, dinner's done. You can even do desserts out of these things. So I would get one of these and a pot, a medium to large pot that can handle most of your boiling duties. You can put some spuds in here. You can boil up some potatoes, make some mashed. You can put some pasta in here. You might not be able to fit spaghetti in here, but you're just going to have to live off of penne and macaroni for a while till you can move up and pot. Now, with that said, if money is not an object and you're just going to go out and buy a full set, then yeah, you know what? I recommend getting a complete set. You can get them all in one box. And this set that I use quite frequently in my videos has one, two, three, four pots, plus a frying pan, a steamer, and lids. Now the nice thing with the steamer is that it will fit in this pot. It'll also fit in this pot. And 
it even fits one pot bigger. Now I don't really find an advantage too much in using a bigger pot and having more water. I don't really find it to be much more quicker or advantage, advantageous than using the small pot. I think they give you that functionality because maybe you want to put this in the small pot because in the bigger pot you're boiling some potatoes. Like you have a few of them in there. Or you can put this in the big pot because in the little pot you're reducing a delicate sauce and you don't need that big, that big pot. So before we talk about the pots and pans, let's talk about the lids. Make sure you get a set of lids with your pots and pans and that they fit just nicely. That's way when you boil stuff, it's going to help keep the heat in. It's going to stop heat escape. Now, when we talk about the pots, this is a, I'm going to say we're going to talk about basic pots first. A basic pot, you'll have a handle, rivet it on to a pot, and that'll be that. Your cheapest ones are going to be all aluminum. And all aluminum ones are going to usually be easier to ding. Uh, we've got some old aluminum pots at the restaurant that are 30, 40 years old. They still work fine, but the bottoms of them are all wavy. Some of the sides are dinged. Uh, we've even had to replace some of the rivets with uh, nuts and bolts. And that's not because they're, um, they're aluminum, that's just because they're 40 years old. But the, uh, the dents, the proneness to dents, that is because they're aluminum. It's a softer metal and it'll bend easier. So I recommend going with stainless steel, uh, assuming that you can, you can afford it, it's in your price range. I would go with stainless. I would also look for a different bottom material than stainless. You can get ones that are all stainless and stainless is not a great conductor of heat. It'll take a lot longer for it to get, for the pot to get hot, right? Cause that's how, how cooking works. The fire from the stove heats the pot. The pot heats the food. Stainless is a poor conductor. So the heat from the fire will have a more difficult job heating the stainless. And then the stainless will have a more difficult job heating the food. That's why aluminum pots and pans work very well because their aluminum is a better conductor. So what they do is they put aluminum or copper on the bottom of your pot and this will absorb the heat much better from your gas or electric range. And it will actually make everything cook a lot easier in here. <coughs> Almost as good as if it was a aluminum pot, but better because, well, almost as good in the sense of heat transfer, but better because this is like 10 times easier to clean being that it's stainless steel and it's more dent and impact resistant. So they'll, they'll look better a lot longer. And maybe you have a kitchen where you hang these up on your, on a rack over the counter or whatever. So you can also get all copper pots. If you're gonna get all copper pots, you should have, they should at least be lined with stainless though, because it'll be easier to clean. Now there might be the occasion where you want a solid copper pot without any stainless lining. Um, if you're getting into some very high-end pots and pans, they do make some like that. Uh, it's a thicker gauge of copper because it doesn't need the reinforcement of the stainless because copper is a lot uh, softer. And those are like four, five hundred dollars a pot. They're ridiculously expensive. You might get one. You might get an all-copper roasting pan. It might be a showpiece. It might sit up in a in a buffet that you never use. So just be in, keep in mind that because copper is harder to keep clean. See the bottom of this, how marked up it is. If you do go out and spend the money on something like that, it might end up looking like this in the long run anyways. Okay, now we're gonna continue with uh, the stainless for a second and we're gonna talk about the frying pan. You want a nice slope to it so you can flip in your saute pan, frying pan, whatever you wanna call it. Um, you want a nice, good, heavy weight. You want to be able to pick it up and know that you're holding it. You don't want it to be so light to, that it feels like it's not there. You might think, well, they're light. They feel nice. It's more ergonomic. 
If it's lighter, it's a thinner gauge uh, metal. It won't heat as evenly. You'll get hot spots in the pan. You'll get cold spots in the pan. And it, as soon as you turn the heat off, it'll get cold. When you turn the heat down, it'll cool off too quick. You want a nice heavy, heavy pot, heavy pan that holds the heat. And open up the box in the store, or they usually have ones out that are like demo pieces that are like chained to the rack. Pick it up, make sure you find the, the handle comfortable. I might sit here and tell you that KitchenAid pots and pans are the best pots and pans you'll ever have, but the handle might suck for you and you might think, wow, this guy's an idiot. I can't hold it right. Like there's something wrong with him. So make sure you test it out. Try it and make sure it works for you. Okay, moving from that, let's just move over to a nonstick frying pan for a second. Um, I'm going to tell you that I consider these disposable because the nonstick in these frying pans, um, I find that the frying pan is probably the nonstick item that gets the most abuse. And I've always found the price of these to be hilarious. Uh, you'll see them full price, $100, $120. Sometimes, depending on the brand, you might see them between say $80 and $120 individually by themselves at the store. The same store will have them on sale for $19.99. That's when I go, I will use one of these till I can't make an omelet with it, and then I will toss it in the trash and buy a new one. Uh, you want the same characteristics that you want in a regular frying pan. You want a nice weight, and you want a good, decent slope so you can fry, you can do them some flipping. Now, continuing on with nonstick, let's talk about nonstick pots for a minute. Like this. You, everything I said about regular pots holds true for nonstick pots. You want a nice, thick gauge. Um, I believe that this is these are all aluminum pots, but they're they're thick enough not really to get beat up. When they do them with the nonstick coating inside, the Teflon. It usually, they usually, because they're a premium product and not, they're not like the base aluminum pans, they usually do make them of a thicker gauge. It's got some weight to it. Um, the reason you might want to use this over a conventional uh, stainless steel lined pot is because maybe you're going to do some sugar work or boil something um, with molasses in it or something. It'll just be easier to clean out of this. Um, you wouldn't want to do any tomato sauces in here, the tomato acid or a lot of wine because the acid is going to eat up the Teflon coating. Uh, also, you wouldn't want to do the nonstick coating, especially in the pans, is going to stop you from being able to deglaze properly. If you're going to sear some meat and then pull it out and deglaze, you're not going to get anything stuck to the pan to deglaze. So, Nonstick, they're actually not very good for making pan sauces either. They are good for boiling uh, soups, especially if you're gonna if you're gonna make soups from scratch and you're gonna do like a cream soup. I would use a nonstick all day long. Um, if I were doing a tomato soup, I'd use a stainless steel. Um, these are not a must. You don't need to go out and buy two full sets of pots and pans. Um, I have two because this is what we had. And I was at a store that was going out of business, and I got the non I got the stainless set for eighty bucks, regular like three hundred. So I just happened to luck out, and because they're both KitchenAid, the lids are the same. And that's something I want to mention too. This lid is stainless steel here. This lid has a silicone coating over the handle to make it a, a cool lid. Stay cool, sometimes they call it that. The pots are all this, like the pots, they all have the same dimensions if they're the same size. So I can use this lid on my nonstick pots, I can use it on my stainless pots. So I use the silicone handled lids for everything. Another thing I want to mention is a wok. A wok is a great frying pan if you want to do 
stovetop deep frying. That's what, this was my grandmother's pan. It's been in the family for 40 years. She would make egg rolls all the time with this thing. She would fill it up with oil, deep fry her egg rolls. Uh, we have a couple woks at the restaurant. We use them for stir fries. Um, and in Asian restaurants, usually their woks go on special burners that throw out like 50,000 BTUs. They are crazy hot because you cook very fast in a wok. So a wok, in the restaurant, the wok is one of the thinnest pans we have because it's a actual restaurant wok, even though we don't have a wok burner. Um, it's crazy thin, it's cast iron, and when you put it over a 50,000 BTU burner, that thing gets hot almost instantly. Your vegetables are cooked in a matter of seconds. Now, I think the last thing I didn't talk about yet is this steamer. It came with the stainless steel set. It fits four different size pots. It's perforated. So basically the boiling water will steam. It will pass through here. You put a lid on top of it and the lid contains the heat and it cooks anything you have in here. Uh, by steam. You can put vegetables in here, you can put fish in here, you can put chicken in here, um, you can put beef in here if you want, but, um, and I believe it fits the different size pots just because you might want to use one pot uh, for another task and then you can just grab, like if this only fit one pot and that was a pot you used to boil your potatoes, you'd have a hard time boiling your potatoes and then steaming something else. So I think that's why they make it to fit multiple pots. So you could use your potato pot to boil your potatoes. You could put this over another pot and boil and steam a salmon or other way around. You could put this over the little pot and steam a salmon, or you put this over the big pot and steam a salmon and you could reduce a small sauce um, in a smaller pot. So I think that covers basically the different types. Uh, now I just want to talk about sizes for a second. Uh, you want to always use the smallest pot that you can get away with uh, to properly cook something because when you're gonna if you're gonna boil something in a pot if you put okay if I fill up the biggest pot I have with water and I turn it on it's going to take more time for it to boil than a smaller pot because there's less water in it and that's just a waste of energy you're going to notice it in your uh, in your bills. Now, for efficiency sake, sake, though, if you're going to be doing a lot of blanching, you might go with the big pot and then start with your more neutral uh, vegetables and then work your way to your darker vegetables and use the same water over because you'll have a shorter recovery time. You'll put your, your say, you're, say you're going to do some broccoli and some carrots and some asparagus. You're going to blanch them all. Uh, you put your asparagus in the water it's gonna lose its boil. It's gonna come back really fast. If it is a bigger pot and your burner can keep it heated, you're gonna take them out. You're gonna shock them while you put your next vegetable in and you can, you can run, a, run a line like that through your, through your big pot. Uh, we do that at the restaurant. We have a big pot for that. We can push to three or four different kinds of vegetables uh, before the water needs to be changed. But if you're only gonna do a single vegetable, use the smallest pot you can because you wanna use the least amount of water you can to try and conserve that water. Um, also, if you're going to be making a sauce and you want to reduce it, you need to think about the, the, so the pot. Um, if you have a really wide lid, like if I were making a liter of sauce and I put the same liter in both of these pots, it's going to be a lot less deep in this one. There's going to be a lot more surface area. It's going to evaporate faster. And sometimes you don't, you don't want that. Basically what will happen is if I'm making a smaller sauce, a smaller batch, I want to use a smaller pot because I might need a certain amount of time for it to simmer to extract all the flavor out of the ingredients. And if you put it in a large pot, just the surface area is going to cause it to reduce too fast and you're not going to be able to extract all the flavor out of uh, your aromatic ingredients that you want. So if I'm making a, a sauce, let's say I'm gonna make a demi-glaze, for example, I might start in the big pot to make my stock. 
and then uh, demi glaze is half Estefad and half uh, Espanol. Um, it's equal parts Estefad and Espanol uh, reduced by half. And it all starts with the same, same stock. So you make a beef stock, and then that is basically Estefad. You make an Espanol, which is a roux thickened beef stock, and it gets a new Mirepoix. So I would make the stock in here. Boom, stock's in here. I would pour half of it out um, somewhere just to, uh, actually a little more than half of it. I think proper Espanol is a stock reduced by half and thickened. So I would put my stock off to the side, uh, three quarters of a quarter of it. I put a quarter of it off to the side with three quarters of it in here. I would reduce that down by half and it would get a new mirepoix and vegetables. Um, so actually I might even drop down to this pot. That's what I would do. I would take this pot and make a stock and then I would pour out what I needed into a smaller pot and I would reduce that by half. And then I might, then once it's reduced by half, I might put it back in the big pot with the stock, start reducing it. And a good demi-glaze takes hours to make. So you wouldn't want to let your sauce get more than say less than half of the big pot. Once you get below half, it's time to downgrade to a smaller pot. So if you're gonna be doing a big reduction, every time you get to half of your pot, take it and transfer it into the next smaller pot because what's gonna ha you wanna maintain, especially something like a demi-glaze that takes like eight hours to make. If you do it in the big pot, it's just gonna take, it's gonna go too quick and you're not gonna get the proper flavor um, development. That's what I was trying to say the whole time, proper flavor development. And you might even end up in, you might start with this full of liquid and end up in something like this. Um, and even half of that is your finished product. That would be a really, really rich, rich, rich demi too. Okay. So I hope I wasn't too haphazard with this video. I hope you liked it. I hope you got something out of it. And if you have any comments or questions, leave them down below and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Thanks, and have yourself a great day.